here right now. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Tuesday, March 14, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Hall of Famer Michael Irvin has filed a, has refiled a $100 million lawsuit against Marriott Hotels for what he says uh, was a lynching of a black man uh, at the Super Bowl. Today, his attorneys uh, released a video uh, from Marriott that, sh- that they claim shows Michael Irvin did nothing wrong after a female Marriott employee accused him of saying something uh, obscene to her. We will break this thing down and show you some of that video as well. Four Republicans continue their assault against diversity, equity, inclusion by passing a bill out of committee that could very well prevent historically black college fraternities from being on the state campuses. We'll break down this bill and why it worries uh, D9 leaders. Also on today's show, uh, black hair in the entertainment industry. We've t- we're a lot of people talk about, a lot of women talk about how it's difficult to be in Hollywood, to be a model and have folks who do your hair properly. But we'll talk to uh, the uh, stylist for First Lady Michelle Obama and many others in Hollywood uh, with my man Johnny. We'll talk about that very issue and how Hollywood, the agencies need to be hiring black hairstylists who know how to do black hair. And in our Marketplace segment, we'll talk to the creators of the Melanoid Chronicles of the first ever Millennium African American Encyclopedia Series. And it's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Folks, uh, Hall of Fame wide receiver Michael Irvin and his lawyers held a news conference today where they unveiled video shot at a Marriott hotel in Phoenix, Arizona during the week of the Super Bowl, which has led to uh, Marriott, which led Marriott to kick Michael Irvin not only out of the hotel, but ban him from all Marriott's across the country. And so supposedly on February 5th, uh, Irvin was accused of making an alleged unwanted sexual advance uh, to a hotel employee at the Renaissance Phoenix Hotel. Mm, but the Irvin uh, defense team uh, unveiled a video that was finally released that they claim shows he did nothing untoward towards this woman. Watch this. Okay, as we start here, y'all can see up to the top right. Um, Michael is outside with the gentleman that were here last time via Zoom. Um, I call them the TMZ witnesses because they were the first to uh, interview them, but it's uh, th- three gentlemen. If you notice his body movements and what's going on, he's obviously going to be very friendly. There's some other people actually that 
I don't know their identity, take a picture. That guy right there on the left, stop it. And go back 10 seconds, can you do that? When I talked about the people that were in the back, talking, I believe a complaining witness, I believe it's this gentleman here who's some kind of a manager, and then you'll see the witness who's been back come out this side, okay? She's gonna walk way around here to this pole instead of back to where her job would be back that way. Okay, go ahead and roll. There he goes. She'll come this way pretty soon across the bottom. Also, when she walks in, you'll see she kind of looks around the pole to see if Michael is still coming. You see her just barely duck her head. Here she comes. Right there. You see how she stuck her head to the right? Now pause it. Now, she's way ahead of Michael. If she was to continue at her same speed for her job, she should be way over at the bar in a second. But she clearly slows down so that they're going to intersect at that kind of juncture where you have to walk in the bar. So go ahead. This is the shake I talked to you about in the beginning, the opening shake. Pause it. This guy over here with his hands on his hips is the angry manager, okay? If you go back a few seconds, I want him to see what he does with a hand clap when he sees her with Michael. He's going to behind the bar. You'll see him walk out. So focus on him this time instead of on her. We went back a little far. It is not as granular as it should be. Okay. Well, we got it coming now because here she comes. He sees her back there where he's vectored, and he comes up, the, in, the manager. And you'll see him when he sees her. Watch his expression when he does. See the claps? I don't know what that is. Then he comes up here, and you can see he's, he's visibly frustrated at what's going on somehow with her. Now let's take your focus back to Michael and her. As you can see, they have friendly interaction. The body language is good. And they're just talking. In fact, as you see, he keeps more space from him than he does when he's talking to any male at any point in the bar. Some of y'all probably wish he'd keep more space when he talked to you. <laughs> That's pacing, hitting his hands. He's upset over there on the left with whatever's happening. The guy in the gray up top. That's the security guard that's wandering around. He'll, he'll circle around many times around Michael and her. Pause it one second. Now, we've been going for a while. They're having a lot of conversation. As, as Marriott released in their statement, they said basically, he said one word to her, an offensive, vulgar thing that he did not say, and it's clear from the video and from these witnesses. But they have a very lengthy conversation, and no one's trying to tell us what that is. Go ahead. some kind of joke, I believe, to him. You seem kind of bend over. She's shaking her head back and forth like that. He walked in closer to her. She didn't back up at all. Now they're shaking hands. Now I want you to watch the end interaction here. Because she's going to kind of, when the people come up, she'll kick her leg. As she walks off, she's still talking to Michael over the shoulder, all friendly. There you go. Kicks her leg. And see right here, she's going to look back over her shoulder and think of Michael. Now pause it. Pause it. Okay. They claim he was leering at her. When he looks back in the bar, she's way gone. Because you're about to watch, she's going to go over here, and that guy is going to go very, he's going to get very visibly upset with her. And basically, there's somebody who's, I don't want to use the word abusive, but there's somebody who's really being forward to her. It's this gentleman here. It wasn't Michael. So watch what happens. Okay, go ahead and roll the tape. You see him grab her, and she falls down positive. Now Michael's looking over there for the first time. He's not watching her. He's talking to these guys. You'll see in a second they turn around and they start talking to him, the guy in the white hat. Okay, go ahead. See? Now 
Now Michael walks out to go take a selfie with this, we believe, Renaissance employee, 99% sure. And the security guy stays right there with him, who's been around for the whole conversation, really. Shows mind where the elevator is. Stop. There's nothing else relevant on this tape. It just shows the lobby for another uh, couple of minutes. All right, folks, we're going to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk with Clarence Hill, uh, who is the Cowboys beat writer for the, for the Fort Worth uh, Telegram. Uh, talk about this case. Uh, Michael Urban has been fighting back vigorously. Uh, his attorneys say, uh, Marriott, you're going to have to pay up. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, we've seen the headline. Major tech companies laying off. Google, Facebook, Twitter, just to name a few, and tens of thousands have been laid off as a result. On the next Get Wealthy, we take a look at what it means to recession-proof your career in tech. Joining me will be Kamika Tover, and she's gonna be sharing exactly what you need to do to turn anxiety into achievement. Shifting our mindset to thinking that only opportunities exist in big tech is something that we're gonna have to like shift fast because there's so many opportunities that are out there that we have to change the way we were thinking about our careers. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it, and it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other, oh, money, we don't, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so that's definitely something I'm trying to fix, too, is just show there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player, you can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you you know, showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered. Clarence Hill is the Cowboys beat writer for the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Uh, he has uh, covered Michael Irvin for a number of years. Glad to have him on the show. Yes, I do allow Omegas on the show occasionally. Uh, all right, Clarence, let's uh, get right to it. Uh, when, when this story dropped, oh, I, yeah, I forgot your short horn. Uh, uh, yeah, welcome to the SEC. Get used to going five and seven. All right. Let's get right to it, man. Uh, look, here's the deal. I remember when this story happened. It was it was strange for them to literally remove Michael Irvin from his hotel, throw him out, ban him from all Marriotts. Then they fought the release of this video. Marriott, uh, the hotel folks, they, it, they the lawyers uh, disobeyed the judge's order, so he mandated that this uh, video be released. You were there at the news conference. Uh, and it is clear Michael Irvin and his attorneys are pissed off with what they saw on that video saying, how could this man make a lewd comment when you saw the reaction of this woman on the video? Yeah, the, the, the body language does not match up to the allegations of the case. Now, just a couple of uh, some background. According to Marriott, the NFL told them if they noticed anything or their employees did anything uh bad or, or something wrong at the hotel to notify them. So that's why they notified the NFL when they when this supposedly went down and he was removed from the hotel and removed from NFL coverage. That was the NFL edict that, you know, 
on our employees or their employees. If something went bad, then, then they would be noticed and they would handle that. But looking at this case, you know, Michael Irvin had a press conference last week, and he said it was, you know, being railroaded and compared to a black man getting getting lynched in, in 2023 without any uh, accuse, without any proof. Uh, the mayor came up with some proof finally on the day that they were asked to reveal the video last Friday. They made some allegations, though they uh, at least detailed the allegations that the woman had said, which caused them to do the action. Again, it does not, at least from Michael Irvin's standpoint, from his Irvin, from his attorney's standpoint, it does not match up to the video that he's she's been sexually assaulted or 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 a situation where she's uncomfortable, at least according to their version of the video. Again, keep in mind, there's no audio. It's just video. You know, and we don't know what was exactly said. Michael Irvin said he didn't say the things that was alleged, that the woman alleged in the video. But certainly they are put out there. They're putting their own story out there about the manager and how he was watching them from the beginning. And, and he was more upset with her and, and being more de demonstrative with her than Michael Irvin ever was. Uh, and I, I saw the news conference, and again, you see this video. Um, the way how the conversation even ended, I, I can only if somebody made a lewd comment to you, that's not how. I mean, you would think the video would show her sort of, you know, falling back, shocked or stunned. That's literally not what we saw, and they sort of walked us through this video. Uh, and so I, I think Mara's going to have a hell of a lot of explaining to do uh, well, while they were so adamant that Michael uh, Irvin did something wrong. Yeah, and I don't know. You, I'm sure you know what the lewd comment was. And if you want to put the comment, at least the alleged comment on the air, you know, that's fine. But I know I, I've talked about this. If my daughter, girlfriend, wife, whatever, if someone made that statement toward her that, that alleged to make Michael Irvin, it would not be in a minute conversation. They would walk away immediately. I would think they would, they would, and maybe, you know, just talking to different people, people handle things differently, but the alleged comment that was made, if you, if this was made and, and you were bothered by it, why would you continue the conversation? Why are you shaking hands, doing all this other stuff at the end? Uh, none of that at least jives with the conversation, but not only Mary, Mary's going to have a problem, um, and maybe the NFL who, who, who kind of rushed the judgment on Michael. The, the, the other part here that, that must be noted, no criminal charges were ever filed, okay? So this is not a criminal case. This is a he say, she say case in the court of public opinion, certainly in, 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 in a civil court to a certain extent. Michael's trying to clear his name, trying to get his job back. But I don't know if there's a path to total uh, immunity because, you know, it's not like a judge can say, you didn't say this. You know, there's no, you know, because it's not a criminal case or you are innocent, The thing that the thing that jumps out at me here, uh, I mean, look, Michael Irvin and I, Michael and I, we joke a lot, a lot about this. He knows I can't stand the Cowboys, uh, but look, professional, professional, and, and I do joke with Michael when I say, man, Michael uh, was great for me in my career. I won a whole bunch of awards when Michael Irvin was out there, uh, you know, getting busted in hotel rooms. I, I, I you know, I, I broke that uh, that drug story, uh, but I remember also broke the story when he had the rape. Uh, settlement when he was accused of rape. And I remember he was leaving Cowboys Cafe and he, he yelled to the media, same intensity, same intensity when he was cleared as it was when he was accused. Uh, and, 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 and I called him um, and, uh, you know, about a few weeks ago and, and, and he said, also public, he said, listen, he said, you know, I've done a lot of stuff in my life that was true. He said, this, I didn't do this. And, and, and I've seen uh, Irvin uh, take the fall for stuff, but here he is absolutely angry with how his name has been dragged through the mud by this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's killing his career. And certainly, you know, we know his reputation, we know his history. I think that's part of the, the, uh, the thing here, certainly in the court of public opinion, was Mike Irvin, he did it, you know, and, and that's the way he feels, is that I, you know, people already believe I'm guilty because of my past, and you look at the situation, certainly I was there, you know, reported with the same intensity, he, you know, he certainly said that back then, and he, he hopes to be able to say that now, report his innocence, report that, that he's been exonerated with the same intensity, and, and, and you know, he, he's devastated, his family's devastated, you know, it was one thing when he was, you know, a player. It's another thing now, you know, at this point in his life, and he has this, you know, 
blossoming media career with the with ESPN as well as the NFL Network. That's all on hold right now. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and it was a lot of embarrassment, and people began to say all kinds of different things like that. And so, uh, and again, he, uh, you know, he wants his name back. Uh, as I said, his lawyers have, they filed a case in Collin County uh, to get this legal action going, to get the uh, video release. Now they've refiled in Arizona. Uh, and so now it's going to be very interesting to see what happens as this case moves forward. Does Marriott settle? Are we seeing depositions? Uh, but based upon what I saw and heard today, uh, Michael Irvin and his attorneys, uh, they are not going to back off of this uh, anyway whatsoever. No, they're, they're fighting it to the end. I mean, this is Michael's career. You know, and, and they're not backing down, and they're, they're going to take it as high as they can take it, uh, certainly trying to get his name back, trying to get his job back. Uh, you know, it's personal to him. You know, I've you know watched him the last couple of weeks, and, and he's hurt. You know, he, he's beyond himself and in, in, in disappointment and, and saying, I did nothing wrong here. Yes, he's said, I, you know, certainly we all know what he's done in the past, accused of being doing, but he says— in, in this instance, I did nothing wrong, and and, and I, I'm being accused, I'm being tried. You know, as he said last week, I'm being hung uh, w- without evidence. All right. Clarence Chill Hill, uh, Star Telegram, man, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right, got to go to break. We come back. We'll talk about this with our panel. Uh, don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, folks. We want to, well, again, the more likes we get, uh, it has an impact on the YouTube algorithm. And so please hit the like button. Also, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Don't forget, you can also watch us now on Amazon News. That's right. If you have Amazon Fire, simply go to the news section, uh, click uh, news, and you can actually see See our 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, Black Star Network streaming channel. Also, support us in what we do by giving to the, uh, our Brenda Funk fan club. Check out money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo, RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Bookstores nationwide. Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, or download your copy on Audible. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Bill Duke. This is Diallo Riddle, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Stay woke. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's uh, pull up our panel right now. Uh, joining us uh, on today's show, we, of course, 
uh, have uh, Randy Bryant, DEI Disruptor, Dr. Jason Nichols, Senior Lecturer, uh, African American Studies Department, University of Maryland, College Park, uh, and of course, uh, my man, Dr. Larry Walker, uh, out of Florida. Glad to have y'all here. Here's the whole deal here. Reputation is everything, everything, Randy. Uh, and so Michael Irvin, absolutely, if he believes he did nothing wrong, uh, he should fight this thing tooth and nail. I hope he does. I hope he does not give up. There have been too many instances of false allegations against black men. And black men, unfortunately, are guilty until proven innocent, which is not right. And I hope that after they're done with the case against Marriott, they actually go after a civil suit against the woman who's making the false allegations. It, it, this cannot continue. Yes, it's hurting his career, but even when this is cleared up, and I believe it will be, there will still be smoke. It never will be the exact same. There will always be doubt. And that is a burden on black men, that he has to carry that around. Uh, the thing here, Jason, um, again, watching that video, and yes, it's just video, there's no audio, but you would think that if Irvin said something obscene, as this woman alleged, we would see a different type of reaction on that video. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, when you look at it and, and you take into account, you know, how a reasonable person would, would uh, react, now, that's not to say that somebody may not react differently, but with the actions that were taken in terms of banning him from the hotels, leaving him on Super Bowl weekend without anywhere to stay, with that kind of reaction, I think you should have more solid proof uh, than just uh, one person's word. And, you know, to me, it, it, it seemed like uh, the reaction by... Uh, by Marriott is not supported by the video. Um, and I think you do have to fight for your reputation. That, that's incredibly important. Uh, that's something that will follow you. And we know, and as you stated in your previous interview, Michael uh, Irvin's reputation has taken some hits over the years. He can't afford any more. And he had a good job. He, had, he was seeming to rebuild uh, his brand and his reputation. He deserves that if he's, he's not guilty of, of what's being said uh, about him. And from what I can see, I would lean toward that. Now, that's not to say that it's a definite, as you stated. We don't have audio. We don't know what he said. But from what we can see, it doesn't appear to support what's being alleged. And, uh, you know, I, I think he deserves, you know, at least for him not to be smeared the way that he's, that it's seeming like he's being smeared right now. Uh, Larry. So, Roland, you mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, the challenge ups and downs that Michael Irvin has encountered in his professional career in Africa. And I think this is, this is, this people assuming based on some of those issues that whatever was said between uh, Michael and, and this lady are accurate. And, and that's unfortunate in today's society. And I'm really interested to in see how this plays out over the next couple of weeks, couple of months. And you said, Ro I mean, Roland, you've been really clear as you point you made in terms of the, and even the last interview that, you know, Michael has been really, and his attorney's been added about that. He didn't say, say the things that he's being accused of saying. And Marriott's re response to this allegation was substantial in terms, like I said, putting him out of the hospital, banning him, I mean, out of, um, out of, of their, their hotels, et cetera. So it, it was pretty extreme. But the, my, the thing I'm thinking about in terms of, like I said, and Irvin and some of the challenges he's had in the past, can he even get back to where he was prior to this, this conversation? And I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that, you know, in today's society in terms of, um, you know, making sure that uh, women aren't being treated unfairly. I don't know if he could ever get his reputation back. And no one, I don't know what he said. No one knows what really was said between those two. And certainly, like, we can watch video, and there, obviously there's no audio, and see some of the, um, their interaction and look at body language and try to assert, assume what happened. But this becomes he say, she say. And the question is, once again, is there any way in terms of him beginning back his reputation that existed five seconds until the interaction? And I really don't know the answer to that question, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. 
All right, fam, we certainly will be following this. Speaking of following, y'all, we are following what's happening in Florida. I have been telling y'all for quite some time that what Republicans are doing in Florida and other states uh, are, are, are tax on black people uh, and anything dealing with equity. Well, uh, now what we are seeing uh, play out here, uh, it, it really deals with uh, the issue of DEI. That they are con- So there have been two bills that have been proposed in Florida that could have a negative impact on um, historically black colleges and universities. There are two bills, Senate Bill 266, House Bill 999. Now, Governor Ron DeSantis backs these bills aimed at restructuring higher education, eliminating all diversity, equity, and inclusion programs from college curriculum. Now, that has advanced in the State House Committee Uh, The bill uh, was approved by a 12 to 5 party line vote uh, by the House Post-Secondary Education and Workforce Subcommittee. It now advances to the full, uh, now advances forward. Now, joining us right now is from Tallahassee, Florida State Representative Christopher Benjamin. Representative Benjamin, glad to have you here. Now, uh, based upon what I've seen, uh, that the, the, the House bill is more draconian than the Senate bill. So explain the negative impact this could have on uh, historically black colleges, uh, historically black fraternities and sororities. Thank you. And also Latinos. Thank you, Roland, for having me. Um, I think what the fear is, is that there is programming that we uh, in our uh, black Greek organizations uh, that we do that, that cater to our community, that deal with issues uh, that are in our community. And I think what the real fear is, is that that type of programming that these uh, organizations are historically known for could be unpended uh, by this particular legislation, meaning that those student body organizations won't get to address some of the issues uh, that they would normally address because those issues may deal with areas of law now that are being sought uh, to be banned. Um, But in terms of our existence uh, on college campuses, a plain reading of the language of, of the bill uh, doesn't provide for our, uh, our being banned from college campuses. Uh, but what the fear is, is that there is a, a part in the House bill that subjects us to the policies and procedures of uh, the universities, and a change in that by a university could possibly have an effect on us. Uh, now, uh, I, I just saw a tweet. Um, Representative Chevron Jones uh, just tweeted, I would like to publicly thank the bill sponsor of Senate Bill 266, Senator Aaron Grell, for hearing the concerns of our black fraternities and sororities by removing language that could have been an unintentional consequence to our organizations. As a proud member of a- uh, Alpha Phi Alpha, thank you. Yes, and, and that's great because, you know, the, both the Senate and the House bill has to have homogeny in order to pass on to the governor's desk. So with the Senate uh, making it clear that the black Greek organizations such as mine, the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, doesn't have a possibility of, of losing, losing its status on college campuses. The, 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 what this shows, and this is what I keep trying to explain to people, we have to be extremely vigilant because the actions of these Republicans uh, could have uh, just significant impact on African Americans. They want to get rid of anything that deals with equity. Yeah, and and and, and, and that's what's sad because you you can't tell me how equity and equality can't live together. And that's, that's the narrative, right? They're, they're going to switch uh, equity for equality. And we know that they don't, they don't mean the same thing. Uh, and, but it doesn't also mean that they can't live together uh, in, in, in harmony. They, there are things for which we demand equity for because of the position that we have stood in society from a historical standpoint. Um, and so, uh, obviously, so uh, a bullet has been dodged, but but certainly uh, you and others there uh, in the Black Caucus uh, got to remain vigilant because, trust me, uh, I don't trust DeSantis at, on anything. 
Hey, li- listen, Roland. They, they call me. They call me the fix it uh, representative. And if in any way we can make a bill better, that's what me and my team are out here doing. Is trying to make these bills better. Even though, even if we can't vote for them at the end, we try to make the bill better for uh, public consumption, and so that we can make sure that our college professors know what they can and cannot teach. I think that's the chilling effect when you purposely make these bills vague then that's when our professors are in fear that they don't know what they're allowed to teach and what they are they can't teach. All right, Representative Benjamin, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Hey, we appreciate you, Roland. Keep it up. Thank you very much. Randy, I want to start with you. Uh, like I said, uh, these consistent attacks on anything dealing with DEI, this is what Republicans are doing. When I keep trying to explain to people, This is not just about public education. They want to go after anything dealing with DEI in corporate America, in law firms, in accounting firms. They want to go after it all. This is all driven by white fear. Right. And it's not just, I don't think people understand, it's not just about limiting what students are accepted, but it also is about limiting the professors that are hired and also limiting what they're allowed to teach. If you look at what's happening in Texas, they have specific words that you cannot use or you can be fired. So one of those like systemic racism, right? So, so, you, you, they really don't want history taught the way that it actually existed. So you're not able to even say these words, much less teach the concepts. So they're restructuring history altogether to ensure that, of course, it favors them and it ensures that they, are, when it comes down to voting and things like that, people are not educated. Um, the word that they're using is there's this whole attack on the word woke, uh, whereas woke, you know, you know, like Michael Harriet said, anytime black people come up with a term that symbolizes our liberation, there are people who use it as change it into almost like a curse word. And so that's what woke is now. And they don't want people to be woke, which is honestly just means aware and educated. They, they're doing everything to stop that. Um, also with these bills, it's not just about hiring new professors. It also is saying that they can evaluate the professors who are there now evaluate the curriculum they've been teaching, and evaluate them on um, standards that don't include DEI. Because the assumption with certain people is that if you are, fall under a marginalized group, a protected class, then you probably only got your job for that reason right and not because you are highly qualified. So it's dangerous what's happening right um, now. Yep. Uh, Larry, you're there at a university there in Florida, State University, uh, and what I keep hearing, there are a lot of teachers and professors who, frankly, they don't know what the hell or to say or do because you don't know what could offend this governor and Republicans in Florida. So let, let me just be clear. I know you know you just heard about the Senate bill, which which is a, a, a not as anti-black as this House bill. I'm just going to be clear. This is these bills are draconian, Roland. And this will become a, become a template for how to destroy higher education, particularly when it comes to taking away tenure, not only in Florida and Texas, but nationally at, in red states. And if either version of these bills pass, it's going to have a ripple effect in higher education throughout the United States. And you're right, Roland. I'm very involved on campus in terms of issues supporting black faculty and staff. And there are a lot of people concerned. This will lead to a mass exodus. Let me also highlight some of the troubling provisions of the bill, Roland. One of them is traditionally faculty members involved in hiring, and then it works its way up the chain, and the president approves it. This bill in the House version, the board makes the decision on who gets hired with no input from the president of the university or faculty. So there's there's no shared governance here. So what you have here is a power play. What the idea is... You either have, you will continue to have uh, members of the board and the president who has more right leaning, and then will hire right leaning professors who espouse certain ideas. And so, this idea that DEI is some kind of is an issue and it's destroying America, but there's no focus on the issues or the reasons or the ideologies of why we had January 6th and why we nearly had an insurrection in this country. So DEI is not, is not the issue here. But once again, Roland, this is a reminder of people that the civil rights movement never ended. 
This has been ongoing. And if black folks don't continue to fight as vigilantly as possible, then this will become a template for what we see in states throughout the United States and will end, be the end of higher education as we know. Uh, you're there in Maryland. Luckily, Jason, you've got Democrats controlling the House, Senate, and the governor's mansion. Uh, but trust me, this could be a template for what could happen by Republicans across the South and how this can negatively impact many of our HBCUs that are state universities. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I'm going to sound the alarm even more than my colleagues just stated. I, I think that this is an attack on the First Amendment, on academic freedom. It, I think it's terrifying. And number one, me being in black studies, doesn't matter what state I'm in, I, I feel like my uh, field and discipline are under attack in particular uh, by a guy who could end up being the next president of the United States. And I think it's uh, also an attack on things like Chicano studies, Native American studies, women's studies, LGBT studies. This is an attack on academic freedom, particularly for untenured people. They're not going to teach the, the ways that they uh, are trained to teach. They're not going to teach the classes that they want to teach. This is something that I think should sound alarms for, for everyone across the country. And again, we're just coming out of a Republican administration. Uh, and, you know, two of our last four governors have, have been here in Maryland, have been Republicans. So I don't necessarily feel 100 percent safe uh, here, even though this is a blue state and, you know, our legislature is overwhelmingly Democratic. But, you know, these kinds of waves can go through the country. We should all be advocating um, yep. <clears throat> for what we can fix here, because this is this is terrifying. When you start saying you can't say certain words, you can't read certain books, you can't yeah. assign uh, certain essays. I think that that should be that should terrify everybody and be a First Amendment violation. And we should see lawsuits all around the country against Ron DeSantis and what's going on there in Florida. All right, folks, hold tight one second. Got to go to break. We come back uh, more on Roland Martin Unfiltered, including Sierra catching lots of heat for the sexy, some say degrading dress she wore to the Vanity Fair Oscar party. I got a few words about that. You don't want to miss that. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from Black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, re-entry anxiety. A lot of us are having trouble transitioning in this post-pandemic society and don't even realize it. We are literally stuck between two worlds in purgatory how to get out of purgatory and regain your footing and balance. What emotions they're feeling and being able to label them because as soon as you label an emotion, it's easier to self-regulate. It's easier to manage that emotion. The next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 
1-800-926-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hello, what time is Johnny? All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Um, you know, one of the things, first of all, uh, while we were um, in the um, uh, going to break there, Randy sent me uh, this here. So you remember the uh, Republican judge who spoke at Stanford University and whined and complained about the so-called woke mob of students who were critical of him? Uh, and there was a dean uh, there at Stanford who uh, took him to task as well. Well, Stanford has apologized uh, for the words of that particular dean. Uh, and uh, again, because they did not like this Trump-appointed judge uh, who they say had been taunted. Uh, isn't it amazing they love to call people snowflakes, uh, but when they get any sort of criticism, they in turn uh, do the exact same thing and just, you know, oh, like afraid of any criticism, afraid of any heat. And so all they do will just complain about something. All right, that's what they do. Uh, control room, have y'all found the Sierra photo? All right, y'all, so here's the deal. So Sierra, of course, the singer, married to uh, NFL quarterback Russell Wilson, uh, she turned a lot of heads and some folks batted a lot of eyes over this outfit she wore uh, to the after parties at the Oscars. Uh, this uh, sheer dress, some say it's not a dress. And, boy, it's been a lot of people been commenting. In fact, somebody hopped on my uh, Instagram page and told me that, oh, someone must have hacked my page because uh, I approved of what uh, she had on. And there were others who, were, somebody else said, you know, I can't, how dare you, uh, you would be angry uh, if your wife uh, wore uh, something uh, like that. L let me remind y'all something here right now, okay? Um, Sierra Princess Harris, that's her actual name, um, is 37 years old. Sierra is a grown-ass woman. And when I hear these people talking about, oh, how dare her husband let her wear, again, that's a grown-ass woman. So, so Somebody said, again, they posted, um, you wouldn't let your wife wear it. Her ass can wear what she want to wear. She grown. Now, if folk criticize what you got or praise what you got, then you deal with that. But uh, what the hell is wrong with some of y'all who want to police what a grown-ass woman? Maybe some of the people out there whining and complaining mad because you ain't got Sierra's body. Now, if that's your problem, we'll take your ass to the gym or call one of our dietitians and get your act together. But what I, what I'm, what I think is just beyond stupid, what we've seen, first of all, we all remember the, the dress J-Lo wore to the Grammy years ago. We still talk about that dress, okay? There have been other people who have worn outfits, who have worn dresses uh, that are just as uh, revealing as that one, but I don't care. These folk, Randy, these folk are really killing me with, with this whole how dare her husband let her walk out the door with that on. <laughs> right. And she's an entertainer who has always dressed seductively. This is not something new. Um, and I believe that she, yeah, she can wear what she wants to wear, but clearly her husband was fine with it. But there's always been a battle for black women being able to be many things, to be professional, to also be sexual. We've always been the ones who are called fast if we do anything. And I think that we need to release that and allow us to be whole women um, and do as we want to do. Uh, they, they, they kill me, Jason, with how did Russell Wilson let. It, it's just like when I, when I went to the, uh, to the Howard 
charter uh, ceremony, there was a brother. I had my African outfit on, and his brother said, man, I wish I would have worn mine, but my wife wouldn't let me. I said, what the hell you mean let? Your ass grown. My wife ain't got no veto power over a damn thing I wear, and ain't got veto power nothing she wear. Now, she asked my opinion about something I'm wearing, or she's wearing. I'll give my opinion. As if she asked. Now I don't ask opinion what I wear. What the hell I want to wear? But that's just that that's just that that's just straight up, okay? But I, I just don't get this whole deal. How did he did he let her? She thirty seven and grown. Right, exactly. I I don't get. First of all, she looks fantastic. I think she looks great. I think I think Lizzo looks great. You know? And I and I I think they they make decisions for themselves. Um, and it's a red carpet. People wear things on a red carpet that maybe we wouldn't wear to the movies. You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand why people were so offended and why people are either offended by Russell Wilson or offended for Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson is a grown man himself. He's he's fine. He's okay. He's not blinking for help. He's next to a beautiful woman, and she's making her own decisions. He's making his own decisions. They're parenting together. They're living their lives together, and they are not worried about your opinion. So just everybody just needs to chill out, enjoy it for the red carpet that it was, you know, for that event, and, you know, just get off right. of everybody, you know, back about it. She looks great. Hey, hey, hey Larry, I got some fool sports actuary filtered on the chat room. Roland, I'm sorry, but you never go against an A-list black celebrity. Yo, sports actuary, she a grown-ass woman. <laughs> I, Cher has worn revealing outfits. Rihanna has worn revealing outfits. Numerous folks have. It's, it's somebody need to go sit y'all asses down. Larry, go ahead with your comment. So I think I'm going to go with this old adage, stay out of grown folks' business. <laughs> That's first of all. Second of all, st- stop trying to police black women's bodies. This is what this is really about. Um, and so, listen, Roland, I don't – she can wear whatever she wants to wear. I'm not on here to get myself in any trouble. She does not have to get permission from her husband. She is – she she owns her own body, and she, she wore it well. I, I congratulate her. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, you know, I know Hollywood is all the pressures you have to deal with and in terms of you wear and what you look like. And she has to deal with all that, her husband obviously being a, um, uh, a star quarterback. So once again, Roland, I'm not going to police a black woman's body. She 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 wore it. This is her decision, and I, I salute her. Hey, let me explain something to y'all, okay? I right, so um, this would be me at the Van Day Fair party. Uh, Roland, I can't believe um, uh, your wife wore that. I'm with her. She with me. You take your ass on. I'm going to sit here and look at her. And guess what? You can look at her, too. But I'm the one going home with her. Anything else you got to say? I thought so. All right, y'all. Sierra, do what you do. Do what you do. Be fine and grown and wear what you want to wear. And the rest of y'all, y'all don't like it, take your asses to the gym. Coming up next, my man Johnny is going to be here. We're talking about hair and also how Hollywood needs to get his act together to hire more black hairstylists. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, where we have a great appreciation for Sierra. Back in a moment. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 
1-800-926-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Coming up on the next Black Tape, a conversation with Professor Howard W. French on his new book, Born in Blackness, covering 600 years of global African history and helping us understand how the world we know today is a gift from Black people. There could have been no West without Africa and Africa. That's on the next Black Table with me, Greg Carr, only on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hey, yo, peace, world. What's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, y'all, let's talk about hair. This has been one of the issues that many black women uh, in Hollywood who are models in the music game have complained about for years, uh, the black women who are also in television, TV anchors, that you got a folk who do their hair who do not know how to do black hair. Um, when you talk about uh, the styles, when you talk about uh, the items we use, uh, when, when I, uh, we always jokes, when I um, did my TV One show, News One Now, that was so, so the studio that we used was at NBC News Channel. So whenever NBC, whenever Brian Williams or Rachel Maddow or any of them would come to Washington, D.C., they would do their show from the exact same studio. And so that was a, a two deck. Uh, table that was right uh, on the left side, and so um, on the on the top shelf uh, was uh, you know one of those uh, brushes uh, that is easily that for white folks' hair. That's what Brian used. On the bo- bottom, it was a bristle brush. Well, that's what I used. Uh, we didn't use the same hair. Uh, we've heard the exact same thing on the issue of makeup. How black folks are made up. We've heard this. How black people are licked. We can go down. We can go down the line uh, about this because we 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 talk about again how uh, the different shades in, in terms of how we are lit, how we are shown. So the topic came up on Sherry Shepard's uh, daytime talk show, uh, and and so watch this conversation. So this is one thing I'm very upset about. A black model posted a viral video of how her hair was styled for a New York Fashion Week show. Okay, look at Raven showed a clip of stylists attempting to do her hair, but this was a fail. Look at this. What are they pulling? It's like they're pulling. What are they doing? I hate this. And so they do. We're pulling on her hair. Pull, and then they attach a synthetic... They attach a synthetic, like, tail to the back of her head. Her face looks beautiful. The hair, I don't know what happened. Ah! This is a big complaint with black models and actors. And, and you know, when you're on a set with people who don't know how to do your hair. In the, in the modeling community, I, I don't think they have enough black people who know how to do the women's hair. manipulate the hair john so it comes out like this and she looked beautiful but her hair looked crazy and it's and i'm gonna tell you it happens with actors as well when we get on the set and we don't have anybody to do our hair it's usually when we first start out because i was on a sitcom once tell you they didn't know how to do my hair i had pressed it the night before so they could just do it but the man thought the hairstylist thought that it was too oily so he poured face powder on my hair to absorb the oil and then that congealed up and it got really lumpy then he blow dried my hair okay that's like cooking fish in hot grease (laughs) so he burned my hair out and it was such a mess. We couldn't do the show. They had to call. Her name was Julie. She worked over on Living Single. She did Queen Latay for Tiva's hair. She was on the same lot. They called Julie to come and do my hair and fix it all up. And I remember I just wanted to cry because a lot of times if it's not your show, you can't say anything. 
with it. You can't get an attitude. You don't want to be seen as somebody hard to work with. And it really messed up my hair. I lost some hair. And this is what I hate. John, when you go on the set, I did another sitcom. And when they say to me, this is what they always say, oh my gosh, you're naturally pretty. We don't have to do anything. That's cold for we don't have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> Folks, Johnny Wright is the author of Natural and Curly Hair for Dummies. He has styled uh, hair for the likes of First Lady Michelle Obama, Tamron Hall, and many, many more. Uh, of course, uh, I knew Johnny when I was uh, on radio at WVOE in, in Chicago. Johnny, glad to have you on the show. Johnny, this Thanks is for having me, bro. This is not just about who can. Uh, got, glad to have you here. This is not just about who can do hair. This is about economic opportunity. This is about economic exclusion. How black hairstylists, how black makeup artists, lighting directors have been frozen out and then the black artists have been left to fend for, the, 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 the fend for themselves and sometimes looking crazy as hell by folk who don't know how to do their hair, do their makeup, or how to light them. It, it happens all the time. It happens on movie sets, television sets, in, on runways. It happens in editorial there's always a fear when a black woman goes into on set if the person is there is going to know their texture properly and know how to manage it, style it, and take care of it properly. It's a big deal, and it's always a really big deal. That's the reason why I wrote the book. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you have uh, lots of uh, horror stories of getting that 911, Johnny, get here, help! <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens all the time, you know, and particularly on on set because, you know, even with the union, you know, I just applied for the union, and of course, every year they make it harder and harder for you to get into the union. I was accepted last year, and then I had the flu, so I couldn't um, make the interview. So that means I was denied, and now I'm back trying to get back in again. But the thing is, is you would think they would want to have us on set because there are so many black actors on set and you want people there to delegate and know exactly how to do their hair texture. And I have gotten the call so many times, can you meet me on set? Can you come here and can you fix this? Because the person on that set wasn't able to do their texture. And the thing, so you you also have to get around that. And so uh, I'm sure you've had situations where it's kind of like, okay, uh, do the hair in the car or do the hair at the hotel, and then we'll show up. Because, again, that sister, she's trying to look her best. And if you got those union folks who are like, absolutely not, can't do it here, okay, we're going to figure this. We're going to figure a way around this sucker then. Yeah, it, the thing about it is it's just, you know, for me, when we went to beauty school, we learned about all textures of hair. Now, specifically, most of the textures that was in the Milady's book was focused on straight white hair, right? But because I went to Dudley's Beauty College, they focused on natural hair, they focused on relaxers, and they focused on all the things that were in our community. But, but what, what I don't understand is all money is green. You know, when I worked in Chicago... 95% of my clientele was black, 5% was white. But then when I moved to L.A., 90% of my clientele was white, 10% was black. And the thing is, for me, money is green. So I want anybody to be able to sit in my chair, no matter what color you are. It's all about understanding texture and being a, a true hairstylist and, and being able to invite anybody into your chair. Uh, and I, I saw a video uh, you dropped where, where, where you said, yes, you are supposed to learn how to do different textures. If you want yeah. to call yourself uh, a, 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 a celebrity or whatever a hairstyle is, damn it, learn how to do all hair. Listen, if you want to call yourself a hairstylist, period, learn how to do all hair. That should be a standard when it comes down to getting your license. You, they should have some type of, of testing to know that you can work with each texture of hair so there's no such thing as discrimination in your business. So if somebody comes to the salon and they want the hair done, you can service them because you learn how to do that in school. There should be no way that you, 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 you're in a salon, you're in a, let's say, a plaza somewhere, and not anybody can walk in and get their hair done. 
If they go the same for a black stylist to be able to do all Texas hair, it should be the same for the others. Uh, questions from our panel. Randy, you're first. I can't uh, hear Randy, Randy, you're muted. Sorry. When you say that people need, should learn all types of hair, which is a great DEI um, problem to have problem or fix. Right now, when you get your license, are you only tested on one type of hair? So it's according to what school you go to, right? Okay. So I went to Delhi's Beauty College, which is a you know a predominantly black school, but we learn all textures of hair in that school. But if you go to maybe a Paul Mitchell, it will be a little different. The demographics there are going to be more on the white side, and that's what they're going to teach you. But to answer your question, when you get your license, when you go get your state board, there should definitely be a clause in there where you can be tested. You, you, have, a, you have a theory testing, and then you have a technical testing, right? The technical testing should include all textures of hair. So that way you know that this person is equipped to work in any salon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there seems to be the, the diversity is there, but there's no nothing that's been done to create inclusion. Yeah, exactly. It should start at ground zero, which is when you're in cosmetology school. I remember when I was in working at the White House, I was working at um, Immortal Beloved, which is a predominantly white salon. And the owner of the salon wanted me to teach the staff, which was the all white staff. I was the only black stylist in there. Um, they wanted to teach the staff on textured hair so they can all invite anybody into their chair. And that's the type of work that these salons need to be doing across the world. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Larry. Yeah, so I'm glad you wrote a book about this. And we know it, you know, policy wise, the Crown Act, the state and federal level, you know, in terms of how, you know, um, black women's hair in, in, in the workplace, et cetera. But I wanted to find out in terms of the, of the industry with your book. Have you been invited to various places to give speeches and talk about the importance of this, considering all your years of experience in the book that you have? Yeah, so I have been invited prior to the book to, to speak about this in certain areas, but the book just came out in November. It's doing really well. And my 11th City tour has just got picked up. So that's going to start in June. And these are the type of conversations that we're going to have in those 11 cities. And I will, of course, be doing more lectures around this topic. Now that the book is out and it's getting more popular, I would definitely see myself getting invited into these spaces more often. I definitely want to continue the conversation because, again, it's really about texture, right? Anybody can possess that texture of hair. So, you know, these textures go from white to black, but they all anybody can have the texture. So learning the texture is what's key. Then you could, you could take the race out of it. It's really about learning the texture. Jason. So it's, this is a really, really fascinating conversation. Uh, you know, I always think about what I would always hear from women, that they would want a Dominican stylist because they have to know how to do everybody's hair, you know, because yeah. they go from very straight hair to very, you know, tightly coiled hair. Is You know, I, I guess my question is, you talked about beauty schools. Is there a way to standardize this so that, you know, someone in Iowa has to know this, you know, know how to do, uh, you know, 4C black hair. Um, is it standardized just by state or is it is it nationwide? Are there nationwide standards for beauty school? So there's a part of the curriculum, right, where you have to take a, 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 a manual test and showing certain things that you learn in clinical and when you're in school, right? And I remember us learning how to do relaxers and learning how to do also perms, which back in the day was called jerry curls, right? We, those are the things that we have to be able to do in order to pass to get our state board. The, so to answer your question, the same thing can be done when it comes down to understanding all textures. There could be a part of the manual testing of it where you're qualified and you are required to understand and to work with all textures of hair. So, yes, it can be, you know, put in through the state board through each state and basically it has to start with each state at a time and then it could spread around, around the whole country. 
Thank you. Well, uh, like so much of this country, like so much of this country, um, white is over the top of the list. Uh, and as I said at the outset, Johnny, uh, this obviously impacts uh, those women who are getting their hair done. But this is also how African-Americans like yourself are frozen out of the industry. Don't uh, go on to become celebrity stylists or doing shows, stuff along those lines. And so this is how we're also hurt economically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's really true. I mean, this is why I'm so in support of the Crown Act, because they're starting to do, you know, so much work legislative-wise around the country just so people can show up to work as their natural self, you know? And that is going to change, yep. and then hopefully that can trickle down into the cosmetology schools and the state board, and then we can have a more understanding of what is proper when it comes down to how you're dressing um, black women in their hair texture, how lookism and how they're, um, you know, how they're viewed when they walk into the workplace. All those things are systematic things that we need to debunk at this point in time. All right, Johnny Wright, we still appreciate it, man. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. All right, folks, going to a break. When we come back, uh, we'll talk about what's happening uh, with black children. Um, dying, uh, childbirth. What's going on with that? Also, Desmond Howard <laughs> has to check a white man on a plane who says, I bet my status is higher than his. Desmond, like, you want to bet? Wait till we show the video. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, We've seen the headline, major tech companies laying off, Google, Facebook, Twitter, just to name a few, and tens of thousands have been laid off as a result. On the next Get Wealthy, we take a look at what it means to recession-proof your career in tech. Joining me will be Kanika Tover, and she's going to be sharing exactly what you need to do to turn anxiety into achievement. Shifting our mindset to thinking that only opportunities exist in big tech is something that we're going to have to like shift fast because there's so many opportunities that are out there that we have to change the way we were thinking about our careers. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, re-entry anxiety. A lot of us are having trouble transitioning in this post-pandemic society and don't even realize it. We are literally stuck between two worlds in purgatory. How to get out of purgatory and regain your footing and balance. What emotions they're feeling and being able to label them because as soon as you label an emotion, it's easier to self-regulate. It's easier to manage that emotion. The next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hi, I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. And while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble. <laughs> Darlene Turner has not been seen since November 22nd. The 15-year-old teen walked away from her Indianapolis, Indiana home. She's 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighs 130 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Darlene Turner is urged to call the Indianapolis, Indiana Police, Metropolitan Police Department at 317-327-3811, 317-327-3811. A Mississippi family is looking for answers in the death of their son. Police say there was no foul play whatsoever in the death of Rasheem Carter. He is from Fayette, Mississippi, uh, and he vanished on October 9th after calling his mother, Tiffany Carter, and telling her white men were chasing him using racial slurs. 
Tiffany, flanked by civil rights attorney Ben Crump, explain to reporters why they are demanding the Justice Department take over the investigation. Mother, Tiffany Carter, whose heart is broken, but yet she's still fighting to make sure that we catch these murderers. One thing is for certain, as attorney O'Neill and I talked with my investigator, Arthur Reed, this was not a natural killing. Uh, this was not a natural death. This represents a young man who was killed. His head was severed from his body. His vertebrae, his spinal cord, was in another spot they discovered away from his severed head. They have recently found remains that they believe are also Racine Carter at another part of where he went missing. And what that tells us is that this was a nefarious act. This was an evil act. Somebody murdered Racine Carter. My son told me that um, it was three truckloads of white guys trying to kill him. And uh, at the time that he told me, as a mother, you know, I had to think fast. So I told him, you know, to go to the police station because I felt in my heart that they would serve and protect like they obligated to do. Yes, ma'am. But at that particular time, I thought telling him to do that was the right thing to do. But I learned later that it actually wasn't on the behalf of him. But at the end of the day, you know, he did. He was obedient. He did what I asked him to do. And he went to the police and they did not? They did not help him. He asked for help, but they didn't help him. You know, he did, like I said again, he did the right thing by asking. But they didn't help him. Folks, um, again, Rasheem was working uh, in Taylorsville, Mississippi, uh, when he fled the job site fearing for his life following a disagreement with at least one co-worker. He was discovered on November 2nd in a wooded area south of Taylorsville. The Smith County Sheriff's Department and the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation concluded there was no foul play in his death. Authorities conducted an autopsy on February 2nd but declined to comment, citing the open and ongoing search. In Georgia, a former sheriff is headed to prison for violating the civil rights of inmates. Victor Hill is going to spend 18 months in federal prison after a jury convicted him on six counts in October of using unreasonable force and violating inmates' constitutional rights by strapping them down and leaving them in restraint chairs inside the Clayton County Jail, sometimes for hours. Hill was uh, he will also have six years of supervised release and must complete community service. Federal prosecutors wanted him to serve four years in prison. He was a sheriff in Clayton County for nearly 15 years before he was indicted and suspended in 2021. A special election is scheduled for March 21st to elect Hill's replacement as sheriff. Early voting ends on Friday, March 17th. Folks, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers charged with deprivation of rights uh, under color of law and falsifying a document of a federal investigation. A federal grand jury in the Western District of Texas returned the three-count indictment against Miguel Delgado Jr. He is accused of using excessive force in two separate incidents on or about June 15, 2020 and October 20, 2019, while he was on duty at the Bridge of America's port of entry in El Paso, Texas. If convicted, Delgado faces a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison for each use of force incident and a maximum of 20 years in prison for submitting a false report about one of the incidents. Uh, in Texas, some Texas State House Democrats want to increase access to Mexican-American and black ethnic studies in the Lone Star State. House Bill 45 was reintroduced by Houston House Democrat Christina Morales. The bill would require Mexican and African-American studies to be offered in every school district as social studies options in addition to world history and world geography and allow the courses to count towards graduation credit. 
The bill would require Mexican and African American studies to, um, to be offered in every school district as social studies options, in addition to world history and would, in world geography, and allow the courses to count towards graduation credit. Um, Mexican American and African American studies are elective courses in some of Texas 1,250 school districts, with only 63 districts uh, reaching Mexican um, teaching Mexican American studies and 58 conducting African American studies. All right, folks, uh, Desmond Howard, uh, NFL great, was flying, and let's just say there was some turbulence in the air. Uh, who better explain it than him? Watch this video. So I'm on this American Airlines flight, and before we took off, the supervisor comes up, and she speaks to the guy sitting next to me. She said, you want to talk to me? He said, yeah, I think you should remove this gentleman from the plane because he's sick. Talk about me. And I said, I'm sorry, are you a doctor? He says, well, you've been coughing all over the place. This is before we even took off, right? I said, well, you can leave the plane and take another flight because I'm not leaving. All I was doing was clearing my throat. So Carol, the supervisor, she's looking, and guess what card he tried to play? He said, I'm sure if you check our status, my status is higher than his. So I said, Carol, yeah, check our seats and let me know whose status is the highest. And as you see, I'm still sitting on this plane. As a matter of fact, we're in the air right now. The caucasity of him. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, everybody, you guys have a happy Sunday. Peace. Jason, the caucasity of him. <laughs> Un unbelievable. And it, the fact that he brought it to status is... I mean, is is just ridiculous all in in and of itself, you know. Um, I mean, I, listen, people cough on planes. I get a little nervous since the pandemic too, but I don't, re, you know, demand somebody be kicked off of a plane. Particularly, he's wearing a mask clearly, so you know, which you don't have to do anymore. I mean, this is just. Like he said, it's caucasity. It's it's unbelievable that he thought he could pull the status card in order to have someone removed from a plane who hasn't done anything but clear their throat. Uh, if anything, I, I mean, I wish that Desmond could have put the camera on him a little longer so we could see who he is and, uh, you know, actually not to, you know, harass him or anything like that. So we know to steer clear of that individual because he's clearly, you know, something's wrong with that guy. Um, Larry, I've always said so, this here. Having status while flying is the closest we as black people can get to white privilege. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that was like, yeah, check the status. Check the status. Yeah, it's also interesting because Desmond Howard is a Heisman Trophy winner <laughs> and also Super Bowl MVP. So he, he certainly came he came for, for the wrong person, but you're right. I'm glad he, you know, he recorded the video and showed this individual, so he understood what he was dealing with. But like he said, Desmond said, you saw we saw where he he was still sitting on that plane. But unfortunately for black folks, Roland, we have to deal with stuff like this all the time. Depending on where we are, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's a plane, whether it's on the train station, airport, wherever we are, we have to deal with these interactions where people think less of us because of our race or ethnicity. So I'm glad the gentleman um, got humbled. So don't come for a former um, Super Bowl MVP next time. Don't come I for mean, anybody. Randy, this is just what it means. This is just, Randy, what it means when you're black. Uh, and Desmond was kind of like, all right, play, I'm, I'm about to make you real famous. Right, you know, and I'm not surprised that it happened. I think that all of us have been checked in different areas, just living regular life, that someone, one, doesn't feel like we belong a certain place and feel superior enough to tell us to get out or to question while, why we are there. I mean, we you, you see people going to pools and everything, and, and white people 
feeling as if they have the authority to check us, as if we still have to be walking around with our papers. And so it's always tastes so good. It's so yummy when it turns out the way it did in Desmond's case. It's really, I, like, that's, it's my favorite song. I replay stuff like that all the time. Uh, I'll tell you this here. Uh, one of the greatest stories I have ever heard was from Chicago attorney Peter Bino. So uh, I, I played golf with Peter when I lived in Chicago. And so now, now Peter's a short dude. Peter's probably... Five three five four. Okay, Peter, if you're tall than that, my bad. But he's short, so he get he gets on a plane and in first class, and this white guy looks at him and he goes, "Well, you ain't tall enough to play basketball. You're not big enough to play football. So what do you do to be sitting in first class?" <laughs> oh my God. Peter Biden. Straight up, straight up, straight up, straight up. Uh, Peter Bino, without missing a beat, he says, I'm the biggest drug dealer in Chicago. And then opens up his Wall Street Journal, crosses his leg, and doesn't say a word the rest of the flight. And the whole flight, this guy's like... <laughs> he, he ain't know what to do. Now, mind you, Peter's a $2,000 an hour attorney. Okay, used to be a minority owner of the Denver Nuggets. So, but he, he froze homeboy when he said, I'm the biggest drug dealer in Chicago. He's like, that's what you get for asking me that dumbass question. Let me go to a break. You're watching Roland Martin on the filter on the Black Star Network. A lot of these corporations or people that are running stuff push black people if they're doing a certain thing. What that does is it creates a butterfly effect of any young kid who, you know, wants to leave any situation they're in, and the only people they see are people that are doing this, so I gotta be a gangster, I gotta shoot, I gotta sell, I gotta do this in order to do it. And it just becomes a cycle, but when someone comes around and is making other, oh, we don't, you know, they don't wanna push it or put money into it, so. That's definitely something I'm trying to fix too, is just show there's other avenues. You don't gotta be a rapper, you don't gotta be a ball player. You can be a country singer, you can be an opera singer, you can be a damn whatever, you know? Know, showing the, the different avenues, and that is possible, and it's hard for people to realize it's possible until someone does it. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, this is Essence Atkins. Hey, I'm Dion Cole from Blackish. Hey, everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered. We've talked a lot about this other story about uh, infant mortality, uh, and uh, a new study uh, shows you how devastating this is for African Americans. According to the CDC, about 3,400 U.S. babies die suddenly and unexpectedly every single year. A recent study says the number of black babies die at almost three times the rate of white infants. In 2020, the study published by the American Academy of Pediatrics with research from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that the SUID rate, sudden infant uh, death, uh, SUID rate per 100,000 live births was highest among black infants in 2020, surpassing the SUID rate among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Native immigrants, which has been declining since 2015. Joining me now is uh, board-certified pediatrician Dr. Yolandra Hancock from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Doc, glad to have you uh, back on the show. So, okay, why? It is, is, do we know why it's happening to black babies at a rate three times more than whites? Well, 
It's an excellent question. When you look at the data, one of the explanations for the total increase was that, a re that there's a reclassification. So what was previously known as sudden infant death syndrome is now sudden unexpected infant death syndrome. And those of us in pediatrics have redefined how we diagnose it once a baby has transitioned, particularly for African Americans. There are two factors that I feel that are at play. One, we have to look at the risk factors for sudden unexpected infant death. The first is prematurity. We know that babies born premature are at increased risk of SUID. The second is what we call low birth weight, babies who are born less than 2,500 grams. And those go hand in hand, particularly when we talk about an important issue that you've covered, maternal mortality. Maternal health directly links to birth weight and the timing of when a baby is born. The second factor specifically for people of color, particularly black people, is that this number significantly increased during the pandemic. Part of it is housing. How much, how much space does a family have to be able to create space for that baby to sleep in a crib on a flat mattress without having to co-share in terms of bedding? The second is what I call cost of economy. A lot of us do not have a parental leave. So what ends up happening is that we have to sleep based on convenience. It's much easier for a parent to have a baby close by, likely in the bed, if you have to go back to work after six weeks, as opposed to having to get up in the middle of the night every two hours to feed the baby. And unfortunately for a lot of uh, black people, paternal, paternity leave and maternity leave are just not what we have access to. Um, and this is the thing that, again, I, I always make this point, the folks who call themselves pro-life, it's amazing how quiet they are on this topic. Right. You know, I always say people, people aren't pro-life, they're pro-birth. What we really have to think about are the resources that are afforded to families to be able to provide care for their babies. We can push out a bag of formula and a diaper bag, but we can't create space for families to perhaps be given a co-sleeper. There are resources available for parents to have the baby in the space with them and have it be more convenient and, of course, safe. We, in, in the world of pediatrics, want babies to be put to sleep in their beds, on their backs, without excess covers, no extra blankets, a firm mattress. And I know your grandma, your auntie will tell you, well, you slept on your stomach and you were just fine. You don't want your baby to be the one baby that isn't fine when you put them to sleep on their tummies. Uh, questions from our panel. Randy, you're first. Thank you so much for this important information. Um, I know that when it comes to uh, birth rates and death, that this was regardless of socioeconomic level at one point. Is this true when it comes to the sudden infant death uh, statistics? Very good question. Based on this study, there was a relationship between poverty and risk of sudden unexpected infant death. And again, again, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Where's the safe space in a household for babies to have space for them to sleep on their own without having the requirement to co-share a bed? And two, the ability of parents to be able to be at home and not have to stress about having to wake up in the middle of the night and then show up for work the next day. And so when we think through what, uh, from a socioeconomic Economic standpoint, the higher levels of employment, the higher the likelihood that you will have parental leave. And that's something that really needs to be addressed in this country, especially if we're trying to tackle infant mortality rates. This country ranks number 35 among yeah. developed nations. Like Slov Slovenia is, Slovakia is better, is, has a higher position. Poland has a higher position in terms of infant mortality compared to the United States. Thank you for that. Jason. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I know that, there, that we're talking about um, sudden unexpected infant uh, mortality, but I'm wondering, you know, we, we've seen across the country where uh, Republicans are trying to get rid of Medicaid or, or trying to stop Medicaid expansion. Would Medicaid expansion uh, help more uh, infants to live longer, you know, uh, because, you know, I'm thinking because their, their mothers would get the kind of prenatal care that they deserve and they would be able to, you know, I know children are covered, but uh, would, that, would that affect this, do you think, this number? 
Absolutely. I always say that a baby's health is dependent on the health of the mother prior to conceiving. And certainly if you expand Medicaid, you provide access to hopefully what will be equitable health care so that women can optimize their health even before they become pregnant. We know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in pregnancy. We want to make sure that we can address those issues well before conception. And that really links to access to care. And it's unfortunate that especially with the public health emergency ending in May, that across the country you're going to see a decline in terms of Medicaid coverage that will then both directly and indirectly impact the health of black babies. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk about the also the importance of training uh, more black pediatricians and making sure they're in underserved communities in the role you think this will also play in terms of lowering these, these numbers. Absolutely. I think that that's a very important question. One, there's a level of trust when you have concordance in terms of race with uh, with your physician. I know that there are a lot of families that I have taken care of who felt more comfortable and, and feeling trusted that they can share with me that they do co-sleep. And then we start to talk about, well, what's the reason why we're co-sleeping? What do I need to do as a physician? What resources can I connect you to? There's a huge fear and a realistic one that Child Protective Services will get involved, that babies will be taken from parents' homes. I mean, for lesser than co-sleeping, that's the reality when you look at the statistics in terms of how often CPS is involved when it comes to black families. And so increasing the, the workforce in terms of healthcare professionals, particularly in the, in the area of pediatrics, is critical. Two, little over 2% of us are physicians, and the majority of us are really starting to gear towards the subspecialties and the higher paying positions. You know, I always joke that I roll a Honda and Sally Mae is my pimp because I committed to a career in pediatrics knowing that I could have chosen any other career. I initially planned on a career in plastic surgery, but I lost my cousin my sophomore year and I said to my sorority sisters, what good is it if I fix their faces if they can't survive to five? And so knowing that and having others sort of sign on to have that same mission is how we're going to change the trajectory of our children's health. Uh, about 45 seconds left for that parent out there. Is there anything they can do uh, that's preventative dealing with sudden infant death syndrome? The first is to make sure that we focus on putting our children to sleep on their backs. We know that the Back to Sleep campaign has decreased the risk of sudden unexpected infant death by 60%. And have a conversation with your healthcare provider, your pediatrician, your PA, or your NP to talk through. If you have to co-sleep, let's talk through how we can safely create space for you and your baby to be in the same room. All right. Doc, we so appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Folks, Tech Talk is next. Don't forget, if you're watching uh, uh, YouTube, hit that like button, y'all. We should easily be at 1,500 likes. I should not have to say this every show, seriously. Also, of course, uh, leave your comments on our Black Shot Network app. Hit the share like button, Facebook as well. Don't forget, download the app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Watch us on Amazon News. If you got Amazon Fire, click News. Go to the Black Star Network and watch our 24 hour streaming channel. Help us with your resources, folks. Please join our Bring the Funk fan club. Check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at Roland S. Martin.com. Roland at Roland Martin Unfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear How the Browning of America is Making and white folks lose their minds. Available at all bookstores. Get it from Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Download your copy on Audible. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets. A horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, 
whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. This is Judge Math. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mac Wild. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E All right, folks, growing up, we all had the ebony pictorial history of black America to learn about black history. Uh, since then, we have witnessed many more accomplishments, so therefore, how do we chronicle those? Uh, well, uh, the Olani Media Group, they've launched the Melanoid Chronicles, which is the first ever New Millennium African Diaspora Encyclopedia series. It's also the first ever to be created here in the U.S. Joining us now is Olani Media Group's Chief Visionary Officer, uh, Zarina Hamin, uh, joining us from Philadelphia. Uh, so glad to have you here, Zarina. So, all right, um, an encyclopedia series, and so is it hard copy? Is it digital? Uh, because, you know, we all remember uh, those of us uh, who are uh, Gen Xers having all of those encyclopedias uh, and trying to buy each one of them uh, in our families. Um, I grew up in the 80s, so same thing with me. I always had the hard copies uh, in my in my house. So what we did is we wanted to, uh, the mission of Alani Media Group is to merge traditional media with modern technology. So it is available in hard copy as well as ebook for a new generation. So if they have to do book reports in schools and things like that, they can always just kind of go, go and download it. But it's also available for generations like me and yourself, um, where you can get it as a hard copy as well as a box set. Uh, how have folks reacted to it? Because, again, if you didn't grow up with this, you'd be like, you, 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 I'm sure the, the encyclopedia, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly it, is that it's been a loss. It's kind of a lost culture at this point. Uh, you don't have people giving encyclopedias anymore. So I wanted to bring that back. I wanted to bring back the encyclopedia series, and I wanted it to focus on the fact that we don't have, you know, we, we have the Britannica, we have all these things, but I wanted it to focus on the new millennium because the reality is that we're always going to have a lost history in this country. Always. There are so many things, and, I, and that's actually a part of our official statement, is, you know, when Katherine Johnson died in 2020, uh, she received a memorial. Everyone was so—and NASA gave her a Hall of Fame. But four years before, we didn't even know who she was. If Hidden Figures wouldn't have come out in 2016, we would have never known who this woman was, and she would have died in vain. So we have so many stories like yep. that. But what we can do now is we can change the trajectory of that for the future generations. So what the Melanoid Chronicles does is it's there for the other, for all generations. But if you're 23 and younger, you have for the first time your history, people who are first groundbreaking, documented. And that's something that no other generation before them has ever had. That's why the first one is a collector's edition of 20 and 2020. I'm sorry, 2000 and 2020, and we'll bring one out every five years. All right, then. Uh, let's see here. Larry, you're first. 
Yeah, so this is a, a great project. Also, here, glad to hear you from coming from my home, my home city, of Philadelphia. Uh, I got to know that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, can you talk about in terms of you being able to partner with like school districts? This is a really important historical project or other partnerships you, you're creating. Absolutely. So we are, uh, it started actually as we were being featured in Library. So we are now in 13 libraries uh, around the country so far in California, Arizona, Oregon, and um, Vermont. And we're also a part of Scribd, which is the biggest digital library of the world. And we're also in the digital li in the Library of America, the Library of America. So we started there, and then we started having events and talking to other people. Most recently, we just connected with the Philadelphia School District to have a meeting with the Philadelphia School District to implement it into um, schools in Philadelphia. But our overall goal, obviously, is to reach the Department of Education and get it filtered out and put it in all schools. And the beauty of the Melanoid Chronicles is we are highlighting people, all people of the African diaspora all around the world. So it's not just Black America, uh, it's mostly Black America, but uh, we, we're, we're highlighting everyone from the African diaspora. So if you're, I did an interview one time and they were like, oh, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican or I'm Dominican, and we don't have anything like this. And I said, no, you do, because you're also featured. So that's our next move, is moving into the school system. And we're already making our moves into the public and, public and city libraries in the country. All right, cool. Jason. So my, my question is kind of a simple one. Um, who did the research for this, and how long did it take to, to actually complete that research? Excellent question. Two years. <laughs> um, it was two years and three researchers to the point where uh, it was an around the clock. I'll be very honest with you. I underestimated how much work this would be when you're covering 20 years of, of black history, of history of people of the African diaspora. I, I'm very honest about that. I underestimated it. <laughs> so uh, we had four researchers uh, to the point where one of the researchers texted me one day and said, hey, I've been working on this all weekend. Do you mind if I go and get some groceries and take a nap? <laughs> That's how big it was. <laughs> I said, I, I don't, I don't want to deny you food and sleep. Uh, so, <laughs> but it was two years. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure we still missed some people because it was so extensive. And I'll be also be very honest with you, we've already, we're already started the research for the next release of the next encyclopedia series. Uh, and it's almost equivalent to 20 years. I don't know if it was the pandemic or what, but uh, the Olympics, but we are doing, people of the African diaspora in the last three years are doing phenomenal things. So we're already gearing up for that. But the original one definitely took two years and four researchers. Thank you. Randy. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you um, intend on releasing a new volume every year or? Yeah, it's just like Roland said, we all grew up with it. It, it, it came out, this is a series. That's why we call it, you know, that's why it's called the Encyclopedia Series, because, no, this needs to happen. This is what's important about this. It has to change the trajectory completely. That, so you know, that's what, I was, that's what I was going to say to you. The timing couldn't be better. I mean, when you look at what is being done to our schools and how the education is being so limited and really excluding people from the African diaspora, I am just so excited to see what you've done here. And I, I really believe that kids will do as we used to do. And I would just read the encyclopedias as if, you know, it was like a, a, a real book. So I, I'm excited about this. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was very interesting because um, that's a lot of people actually ask me that question. They say, All right, okay, is this going to be ongoing? And I'm like, absolutely. 
because it need, it has to be. And you're right, it couldn't come at a perfect time. I've been reading, in the last few years, I've been reading all of the, you know, keeping up with everything that's been going on in the school district. And they're actually promoting in some states for us to not, to no longer use the word slavery, that they right. were just uncompensated workers. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, that's insane, right? Is, so that, that's why my focus is getting it in the school system. Because what do we have here? Everybody knows, I'm sorry, I'm a big fan of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. And Marcus Garvey said it best, if people who don't know their culture, and we mm -hmm. see that play out every day in our society, are lost, completely lost. If you're only told that you were slaves, and that you are present. No, there was so much more. But again, we're going to be spending the rest of our lives finding out all the stuff from the past. But these kids now, they can have something and say, okay, since I was born, I have a niece who's 16 years old. She was my inspiration for it. She hmm. loves science and technology. I want her to see the first people and that look like her um, who are inside. That's why we did something different with the Melanoma Chronicles. You know, we all know our encyclopedia series is our alphabetical. We decided to do it through category. So if you look at it as science, technology, sports and entertainment, um, government, politics, we wanted to do it in categories because I knew that my niece would immediately go to the science and technology category and see all the people that look like her who are doing these amazing things since she was born. She was born in 2006. Fantastic. Life so, yeah. So I'm really excited about it, and I want to push it through as much as possible. But you're right. We have to get it in the education systems immediately because they are trying to change the rules where they're, they're completely trying to abolish our history because they can't face it because it's too dark for them, what they did. Oh, what? Well, you made a point about uh, understanding Marcus Garvey. Uh, this network is called Black Star Network, which is actually named after uh, the Black Star Cruise Line uh, that Marcus Garvey, his goal was to connect Africans to the people of African descent to the African diaspora. Of course, our goals do the exact same thing with media. So we certainly here understand uh, who, and appreciate who Marcus Garvey is. Um, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, tell people where they can actually find your encyclopedia. Absolutely. So if, and you can get it in hard copy and ebook. So the website, uh, Phil, uh, you, you can go to our Facebook, our Instagram. It all has our website, our YouTube. And then at the bottom, you can go to amgroupllc.biz slash Melanoid Chronicles. And you'll, you can read more about the Melanoid Chronicles. We are currently being featured on 43 Comcast networks, which includes NBC, the OWN Network, Discovery Channel, et cetera, et cetera, which you would see on the website. And you can read more about us and you can purchase either a hard copy or an ebook. And we, the ebook is available through Barnes and Nobles. It's also available through Scribd, the digital library I talked about. Um, uh, Amazon, Audible, all of, so you, you'll, you'll see the whole list of where we're available. And then if you just want a hard right. copy, go to the hard copy. All right, Zarina, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Larry, thank you very much. Larry, Randy, and Jason, I surely appreciate you joining us on today's panel. Thanks a bunch, folks. I am here in New York. I did the Breakfast Club today. It will air tomorrow. Also be doing Ebro in the mornings. Uh, also sitting down with Vlad TV. Also been taking some meetings with the ad agencies. Met with Group M today. Thanks a lot, Errol. Uh, Take care. Cool is tomorrow. Uh, waiting for the folks with OMD to schedule us as well. So we're out here fighting a good fight, trying to get these ad dollars. And so that's the work that we're doing. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow right here. Rolling by Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. How A real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? 
pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. 